So review, right? Water planet, right? We talked about the, the blue, pale blue dot, and that's because uh, we are on a water planet, right? That our, that our planet is, is blue. We read that Carl Sagan thing. We talked about water and how rare water is, generally speaking, um, at, least, at least rare in abundance around the universe as far as we can tell. So one of the cool things about our planet is that water is abundant water, one, and two, water is here in all three, in gaseous, liquid, and solid forms. So that's a key thing about our planet. Uh, we ran through some of the basic stats, uh, uh, depth of the ocean, uh, max depth and average depth, um, the fact that the ocean covers 71% of the surface of the Earth, um, the average temperature of the ocean is cold, it's just a little bit above freezing, and that the ocean uh, has been a, a, a constant feature for the history of our planet for the vast majority of the time that our planet has been in, in existence. We talked about the, the distribution of water, most of it is in the ocean. We talked about the three phases of water, the solid or ice form, the liquid form, and the gaseous form, right? And, and what determines what form we're in is that battle between the hydrogen bonds and the thermal energy. And whoever's winning is gonna determine, uh, or, or, or if it's neutral, that's gonna determine what phase of, uh, what phase of uh, matter our water is in. We talked about the thermal inertia, went through some examples, uh, different expressions of this, but it all means it's hard to change the temperature of water compared to other substances. So there's a lot of so-called thermal inertia, and that can be expressed as heat capacity, latent heat diffusion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we looked at this thermal picture of the Earth and, and commented on that. Um, other key aspects of water, the dissolving power, right? We call it the universal solvent. It's transparent uh, to the, the spectrum of light that you and I at least perceive and a lot of vertebrates' eyes perceive. Um, it's, it, that, water goes, uh, that light goes through it. Uh, we talked about the composition of water. Uh, obviously, seawater is mostly water. It's by far the biggest uh, part of it. And then we have stuff that's little particles that essentially you could see or at least see with a, with a magnifying glass or something that would be suspended materials and the stuff that's dissolved that we can't see. And we talked about major constituents that don't change that much uh, as we go around the world. And then we have trace nutrients and then, or trace constituents, excuse me, and then we have nutrients. Nutrients fluctuate wildly depending on where we are. And, and we talked about gases and other things. Talked about salinity. Uh, you know, 34 to 37 is really the sweet spot there. We talked about circulation and the implication for this different salinity and different density of water allows water to sort of behave as discrete clumps, discrete uh, 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 volumes of water, and that in turn can uh, be manifest as things like circulation and currents. We talked about the, the rinsing of the earth and um, this, this steady state hypothesis where for a lot of these main constituents, even though stuff is constantly being added to the ocean, they don't really, the ocean doesn't get um, more calciumer and calciumer, right? It's, it's sort of staying at this constant level. And the reason for that, again, as we've already talked about, is this biological action, is, is the precipitation of these substances m moderated by life. And then when those organisms die, that material is eventually rained out and, and, is, and is negative. So it eventually sinks out of the water column, and we see that as deposit, broad scale patterns of deposition of different um, uh, critters. Uh, in lab, we talked about uh, additional ways things can come out of the water column, and that, were thing, that was things like our uh, ferrous manganese nodules, and we're doing a lab on that this week, and then there's other things like gas hydrates that can also be on the bottom of the ocean. Talked about deep sea mining. Okay. So that, that's a little bit of review. Last little bit, I just want to go over some things that, again, we didn't have time to get to last, last time. And uh, all of this is, so that for the first step was sort of universal things. You know, water is all this, all this cool stuff. Now, as we're getting onto these last little uh, things, just to flag for you, these are adding, these are really contributing to the variability, the diversity, the heterogeneity of our global ocean. Um, water temperature, right? So water temperature is something we maybe don't think about that much. We saw that in our demo when we did the, uh, uh, the different uh, masses of, of water. But um, basically, warmer, thing, things happen faster when it's warmer. And so we have 
uh, poikilotherms and homeotherms. So we have warm, so-called, not really correctly named, but this notion of kind of warm-blooded critters and cold-blooded critters. It's not exactly right, but the idea that some critters' body temperature is influenced strongly by the surrounding environment. Others uh, are able to um, maintain their own temperature. You and I maintain our own internal body temperature, right? And so we're not as constrained by if it's cold or warm outside. Um, we can still do our digestion at the same rate, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the organisms that inhabit the ocean don't have that luxury. So when it's cold they, and they eat, it takes them a much longer time and, and their, their physiological reactions inside their tissues and, and their body takes a lot longer to say digest that or to synthesize a particular compound or something. Uh, so as with salinity, water temperature is a strong effector of density and therefore stratification of the ocean. So, so help compartmentalizing the ocean into different, different chunks. Um, and, and we uh, perhaps most frequently experience that as, as influencing uh, climate and weather, right? So, so the ocean Right, so we never get, even though we get hot sometimes, we're never as hot as Phoenix, Arizona, right? We're never as cold as the plains, the Great Plains, because again, we're next to the ocean and that, and that acts because of the thermal inertia that helps to keep our coastal environment relatively stable compared to areas more distant, distant from the uh, ocean. Temperature has huge effects on organisms. Just one quick example here would be the classic example that you learned about in your intro bio, which is a thamelus and balanus. So the CH is silent. These are two genera of barnacles. This is the classic example of competition and, and you know, who's where. And so uh, the classic work of Joe Connell, the father of modern quantitative ecology, um, did this in the intertidal. And, and so we have uh, one species here. Uh, symbolized by these light colored barnacles and then we have this other species here symbolized by these uh, sort of darker uh, sort of spotted barnacles and what we found for example in the case of barnacles is the temperature plays a key role in where they are so it turns out that um, temperature limits how high these guys can go in the intertidal so if it gets if it gets hot, too hot, they dry up and die. They desiccate. They, they, they can't maintain the liquid in their systems and they die. So the upper limit is dictated by temperature. It turns out the lower limit is dictated by biological interactions, in this case, competition. But, but in a very clear case of, of the temperature deciding very much so where the critter can live and can't live. Um, as we said last time, we talked about clines. We can get these rapid shifts over a very short period, over a very short distance. We can see very um, uh, distinct bodies of water. And I told you the story when I was scuba diving. I put my hands up to warm, you know, just a couple a foot above my head to warm up my hands into through the thermocline into the warmer mass of water above me. And that's essentially what we're seeing here. So what we're seeing here represented is a boat, and the boat has sent some measurement devices off the side of the boat. Let's call them thermometers. And, and they've lowered a line to the bottom, and every so often there's a thermometer, yeah? So it's measuring temperature. And what we've plotted here on the right is, is the result of, of the data that these guys in this boat collected. And so what we see is up near the surface, it's relatively warm water, right? And as we get to the bottom, it's relatively cool water. Everybody with me on that? And so it's not a, a consistent slope from the top to the bottom, it's pretty much no change in temperature as we go down another foot, another foot, another foot, another meter, another meter, another meter, another meter. And then all of a sudden, whoa, 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 over a very short distance, it changes rapidly. And then we get to another uh, temperature. And then again, that, that lower temperature, let's say here, doesn't change much at all as we go you know, kilometers into the ocean. So this rapid, this area of rapid change is the Klein in this case, because it's being driven by temperature, we call it a thermocline. Um, and, uh, and that obviously, we can, these things are reinforced by fresh water and other things. And this, again, another 
another factor in leading to these comp this, this compartmentalization of the ocean, these different little packages of water uh, moving around the ocean. Um, we also can get heterogeneity based on weather, right? So the stuff we've been talking about so far is pretty much sort of the general generic background thing. When we start adding on things like wind and hurricanes and, and things of that nature, we can get uh, significant uh, changes as well. So this heterogeneity is not just in space, it's in time. So for example, here we go, let's look at this uh, cartoon of this particular area. So in this area, in the summertime, this top panel, uh, in this particular area, we don't have much wind, hot sun, stagnant summer, and the sun is baking down, and this water isn't move. This water mass isn't moving, so that that heating source, that 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 thermal input, is all contained near the surface, and this stuff doesn't mix. So when we have a situation like that, we have a very strong thermocline, right? So we have this pocket. Of, we have this pocket of water here, symbolized by the orange, and then the other mass of water symbolized by the blue. And so as we transition from going from the orange to the blue, really quickly notice the temperature change, right? Again, this, you'll notice this over the a distance of a foot or two, you know, a meter or so, it can be really dramatic. Uh, and so, so if we plotted the temperature, we'd see a very strong <coughs> thermocline. Uh, then as we enter, say, now, so for example, for us here in Southern California, the water is the warmest, well, we've had a couple storms, but, but generally up until right about now, this is the warmest it's gonna be all year because we've had this going on. We've had a lot of warming up, not a bunch of huge storms typically or anything like that. So we have all this, strat this stratification with a lot of heated, 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 heated water near the surface. So if you go surfing, if you go scuba diving, if you go swimming, it's gonna be comparatively warm. And then as soon as that first really big storm, so it might have been that storm, that, uh, that the tails of the hurricane that came through uh, a week and a half or so ago, but really the first big winter storm is gonna come in. So right now we're getting a little bit of that. And so if we were to measure the stuff now, we'd see, yes, there's still a clear mass at the surface and a mass below, but the, di the extremes aren't, aren't, it's not quite as extreme, the differences. Then when we get into the full on winter, and we do get the hurricanes coming through or we get the big winter storms blasting in or whatever and all these rah, 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 then everything is mixed up. And now uh, the, the bottom stuff comes up to the top, the top comes to the bottom and we get no cline, no difference. So we can get this, this heterogeneity can be very seasonally dependent depending on where we are in the world as well. So sea surface temperature varies. So this is, this is a composite looking at the earth Right? And so hot is warmer surface water temperature. And, and again, super dynamic. Check it out. We're stepping through months here, but right, it fluctuates wildly. Sometimes it's the, the hotness is very much so at the equator. Sometimes it spreads out far. And this, again, is only the heterogeneity on the surface. So there's also all that extra stuff that happens below. So the ocean, a very, very complex place. Um, uh, right, we've, we've talked about circulation and how things move around. All of the stuff that we've talked up to this point, uh, spoken about up to this point, uh, influences this. The density, the, the density influenced by, by temperature, by influenced by salinity, uh, by raining events, all this kind of stuff. Another thing we need to touch on briefly is light. So I mentioned before that uh, visible light goes through the water. Visible light, what you and I call light, white light is comprised of a bunch of, um, uh, a range of wavelengths. Turns out that uh, first and foremost, I should say, so we talked about the photic and the aphotic, where, where the light is, where the light isn't. The first thing to say is, uh, in terms of heterogeneity, turbidity has a huge impact on light. So, is my R, any of my ROV team one, Two ROV team, any, any other? Oh, three, wait. Yeah, yeah, three ROV team in here, right? So our ROV teams are, are doing their capstone using some of our underwater robots out at the island. At the island, even though you guys did a trial out there, Matt was out there, you, you guys did a trial and you're like, it's crap, visibility can't see. Generally speaking, 
those tools work way better on the island because the islands are mostly rock. So there's not, a lot, not as much gunk in the water, so it's much cleaner water. When we try to do the same thing, when we look at visibility, how far can we see underwater here next to our coast, the vast majority of Ventura County is sandy beach, so we have all the sand in the water, so it's all, it's hard to see. So turbidity, or the amount of particulates in the water, has a strong influence on how much light is in the water and how far light penetrates into the water. Uh, primarily, we think of, uh, of, of things like the sand, sediments, but it could also be organisms. It could also be life. It could be in the middle of one of these red tides or algal blooms. Okay, uh, so turbidity is first thing. After turbidity, the next big thing that you got to worry about is how far into the ocean. And light doesn't decline linearly, it declines exponentially. And it differentially affects different parts, uh, differentially affects different parts, it, it, it uh, differentially affects white light. So the first wavelength that gets sucked out is red. The next, orange, yellow, etc. The, the wavelength of light that longest persists is blue. So if you guys have watched, hopefully you've all watched our, our videos, our Blue Planet videos, when they talk about bioluminescence and that counter shading and all that stuff, that's really um, brought home with, with the blue light. So for example, you and I are out scuba diving. We're at 100, 120 feet. Not supposed to be that deep, but we are, because we're rebels. And so I pick up a rock to show you something as your professor, and it's a sharp rock and it cuts my finger. What do you see? What color is my blood? It's not red. It'll look, it'll look dark. It'll look maybe purplish, depends on how deep we are, purplish. It'll look dark. If I take my dive light that I have on my hip and it's got batteries and so we're gonna turn it on, it's got a white bulb in there and I shine the flashlight on my hand, then it'll look red because I'm introducing all this white light, right? But if we're just using the background light that comes from the surface and goes the 100 or 120 feet down to you and me, there's, there's no essentially red, there's, there's no red signal that gets to my iris, that gets, gets to my retina. So this is why when you guys look at, maybe your parents have some old National Geographic or something, look at these really cool old photos from Jacques Cousteau and stuff in the 50s, they all look kind of sketch. Or if you watch, uh, like some of the early Creature from the Black Lagoon movies, right? The, for they first come out in color. And all those things look a little like, the underwater scenes look a little, even though they're in color, they look a little crappy. You know what I mean? They look a little um, not saturated with color. It, it's not like, if, okay, if we look across the classroom right now, I see all these really cool oranges. I see the reds in our, our CSUCI shirts. I see you guys have some black or some yellow on that water. Right? You see all this range. But when you look at those old photos from down deep, one, it was the film wasn't super great, so the film wasn't as responsive to all the different color, but mostly it was that there wasn't red light, or there wasn't orange light, or there wasn't yellow light, depending on where they are. So to counteract that, one of the first things people started doing when they, when they started to try to, to get better pictures underwater, they started bringing down more and more powerful strobe lights and more, more of their own white light sources so they could light it up and make it look okay. Okay? So, that's all to say, light de declines exponentially, red drops out first. So because of that, because red drops out first, when you guys have watched those, those videos, um, what's the so-called optically black color? Do you guys remember that? So if I, if I wanna be, so, so if I wanna hide down here, if I'm down here deep in the, the, the deeper parts of the ocean, and I wanna hide, I could be black, Right? I could, I could be the color of darkness. Or the most common color of critters down there is red. Crabs are red, squids red, because there's no red light. So if there's no red light, that's just like being black. And it turns out that it's easier to be red chemically, carotenoids, the stuff that makes uh, lobsters look red, and when we cook lobsters they get like sort of beet red, the shell that stuff is biochemically easier to make. And so, so you can make yourself red, and in effect, that's like um, invisibil an invisibility cloak for most situations down deep. 
because there ain't no red light coming around anywhere. Cool? Okay, so light. Uh, another one that we touched on in our, in our lab, but just to reiterate, is pressure, right? So is another aspect of our world ocean as we go deeper, 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 huge, you know, insane amounts of pressure, of squeezing. And we mentioned that we have one atmosphere of pressure on our bodies right here, here at sea level. We only have to go uh, 33 feet or 10 meters into the ocean to get a second atmosphere of pressure, so twice as much squeezing. So if you're a scuba diver, we use tanks that are pressurized. So when we go down, I take a breath like Darth Vader, right? And what's happened is that's pressurized. And so when I, when I open the valve, the, 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 the highly compressed air squeezes into my lungs. And I feel it, and it's great. And I breathe normally. If I hold my breath and then swim to the surface, I'll die. At, at 33 feet, if I hold my breath and go to the surface, I will, exp I will pop, essentially. My lungs will pop out of my mouth or something because the, the volume of my lungs is going to double in size. And my lungs can get bigger, but they can't be twice as big, right? So one of the first things you learn when you're learning to scuba dive is whenever you go up, you're always exhaling. And one of the things you get trained on is if, if something goes wrong and you have to do what's called a free ascent, you, you have to drop your tank or something, you're trained to put your head up, open your throat so you don't, you don't pinch anything, and you blow out. And again, that's all because of pressure. We talked about in our lab the issues with, with the difficulty of engineering things and going to the bottom of the ocean where these insane amounts of pressure are there. But um, I'll just say that, uh, so the, the, there's, there's those constraints. In fact, some of the pressures in the hadal depths are so deep that they can actually affect proton, protein folding. And so sometimes when we suck up critters from the bottom and bring them to the surface, the, the critters actually, uh, that they, they freak out because what can happen is, um, just like when you squeeze your muscles, you're, you're making energy go, right? You're doing ATP and you're, you're making this, this cell crunch and your, your muscles crunching. Sometimes when we bring up these deep sea critters up, up shallow, they essentially shoot off all their, their neurological signals and they go, uh, and, their, and their muscles actually um, are locked. They're sort of squeezing as hard as they can when they come to the surface. That's because of pressure. Okay, so we have uh, temperature, the stuff we talked about, the temperature, light, um, uh, pressure. And, and then the last little thing, we'll just, we won't go into too much more oceanography because we have to get on other things, but I'll just say that this gets complex, but it also produces some consistent patterns as well. And so one of the, the, the most obvious ones you guys should know about is uh, how that manifests itself on the surface of the ocean, uh, either in terms of the air above the ocean or the water in the shallow surface. So now, if we had a, a theoretical Earth, so let's imagine here's our Earth, and the Earth was not spinning, so, so we just magically held the Earth still, um, this is what would happen. And, and this, in this case, we're talking about winds. But the same phenomenon happens with any type of you know, liquid or gas. So the, the sunlight is hitting the equator, right? Sunlight's hitting the equator. And so it's making it hot, warm. So warm, less dense, floats up, right? Whoop, floats up. Over here at the poles, it's the least amount of thermal energy going into the system. And so there, it's relatively cold. And so there, things are sinking. And so doing nothing else, leaving only this, this non-spinning Earth, what we would see is we would tend to see, after a little bit of flurbing around and stabilizing, that we'd see these winds move around high, uh, that would move poleward, and then they would sink, and then near the ground, the winds would always be going towards the equator. Does that make sense? The, but we are spinning. We are a moving entity. And so this is the thing people talk about, the toilet bowl spinning differently in Australia, right? That's all BS, right? Toilet water spins the way the guys that design the toilet bowl goes in the toilet bowl. But it's making reference to this notion of this Coriolis force. Coriolis force is an apparent force. It's not a real thing. It just seems like it's, it's, it's real to us because you and I are attached to the ocean, or attached to the surface of the earth. So this has the effect of rather than, rather than having the 
air near the ground go from here shoo, straight down, we're spinning underneath it, so it, it acts to create these bands, these distinct bands of winds. Incredibly important for things like colonization. Incredibly important for things like commerce. All that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff, excuse me. So this is what the Coriolis force is. To an observer above the merry-go-round, the path of the ball appears straight, while to someone sitting on it, the ball appears to curve to the left. This exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is the result of the Earth's rotation. Make sense? So things are moving the way they're moving. But because you and I are spinning underneath, it, it looks as if the wind curves. So in the northern hemisphere, go hitchhiking. Here we go hitchhiking. Put your right hand out. Even if you're left hand, you got to hitchhike right hand in my class. So put your right hand out. Right now. Here we put your right hand out. Put your palm up. So that's the way Coriolis goes. So our, our, our arm is the wind. And so it might, we might think we're going towards you guys, but then it's going to be deflected to the right. Okay. So you can so let's say we're right here at this latitude and we're trying to hitchhike. So we put our arm towards the equator and we start hitchhiking and then we and then our thumbs to the right and then we kind of wah 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 right. So in uh, our northern hemisphere we hitchhike with our right hand, our right thumb. In the southern hemisphere they're weird, right? We all know this, Australians, crazy people. They hitchhike with their left thumb and so they deflect the the opposite way. Because we're because the planet is spinning in the same direction, um, and that leads to. To oh, an observer okay. above the merry-go-round. Okay, so watch this one more time. The path of the ball appears straight, while to someone sitting on it, the ball appears to curve to the left. This exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is a result of the Earth's rotation. Okay, so uh, that produces this which is, again, fundamentally important for all kinds of economies and, and, and international trade and all this and that. So we have uh, jet streams. The jet stream is essentially how the, how the air, high mass of air moves uh, between some of these circulating cells. These guys we refer to westerlies because primarily in this area, um, you can sail, if, if you're in a sailing ship, and most of these terms come from the age of sail, when people were really curious about this and were first mapping this stuff. So westerlies, when we're down near the surface, they're going to blow westward. Okay, These guys are called the trade winds because they would bring trade back. This is all Europe-centric Europe names, sorry. But it would bring trade back to Europe. Right. So if you wanted to get your goods to the New World, you would hit one of these. You, know, you, you want to start out about um, you know, north of Spain or so and shoot across. Right? When you wanted to come back to us, you would go down to, or, or back to the, the empire, you would come back to um, uh, like Florida and off the eastern seaboard and you'd go back that way. Uh, this area here near the equator sucks. You might have heard people call the horse latitudes or the, the area, so there's, there's not a lot ever on average wind. And so if you get down there, you're really stuck, Do the so-called doldrums. And, and the exact same thing happens in the southern hemisphere. It's just um, uh, uh, reversed. And so this also explains where we get things like rainforests. We get the tropical rainforests. We get the Pacific Northwest rainforests, things like that. So these, these wind patterns are really, really important. And we have other subnames for all these areas. The reality is these things are much more complicated, right? So this is what, when we talk about winds, Right, so we have the, those, those general patterns of westerlies, et cetera, but things are always constantly being tweaked. And in this case, this is what's going on right now that we can visualize. And so there's still those broad patterns that we can see of areas where the winds are primarily going east or west, but obviously there's additional complexities that enter in there where storm systems or <laughs> islands or continents or something like that, Gesundheit. And then the last thing I'll say is uh, these things uh, do get quite complex. And, but this is stuff that you need to at least have a gross understanding of. So we'll talk about very briefly the Great Conveyor Belt. This is, the, this is a, a, a consistent series of currents that move uh, stuff from 
polar areas to more uh, temperate and tropical areas. The so-called Great Conveyor Belt in, off the East Coast in the Atlantic um, takes a, a long time to turn stuff over. So it takes that, you know, thousands of years or many, many hundreds of years for a molecule that might start up by the Arctic, to, a molecule of water or plastic or something, to kind of go all the way down to the um, equator and then come back. But it turns out it's very important. This is an important way to, to move uh, cold oxygen nutrient rich, rich water into warmer areas where there's more warmer temperatures so that, that higher physiological activity can happen and we get greater productivity, etc. And so this is what the, the conveyor looks like and this is one of the problems that we're now worried about happening and we might see this, this seems like it might be getting ready to start happening. So we're going to go into the ocean in a second, I think. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so here we go. Going down, all the stuff we've been talking about, continental shelves, everything. Okay, so we have the shallow warm water going, hits the cold Arctic, goes down, right? So it's, just, it's going back and forth. So this is what, happened, what we think is going to happen now that we're melting all these glaciers. So as we're melting all these glaciers and this fresh water is coming in, it's messing with that, that mass of water and it's acting like a block. And so this is, there's a huge worry about this. Uh, people have known about this for some time. Hitler wanted to destroy the Great Conveyor Belt. That was his plan. He wanted to freeze out Great Britain. So he had some of his scientists for a while seeing how can we, how can we mess up this giant ocean conveyor belt. Because if we can, right, check it out. If we can, look what happens. Warm water comes up the East Coast and then it kind of boop. I mean, it's not hot at this point, but it's warmer than it otherwise would be. Right? So England and, and Ireland and stuff, they're not, I mean, they're definitely cold places, but they're not as cold as you would think. They're not as cold as you would think. So his plan was maybe we can freeze these guys out, have less crop production, more stressed out. So he couldn't do it, but we are doing it now with climate change. So as we're engineering the planet, one example of the engineering of that is to have all this liquid, uh, this ice turn into liquid water and float out and screw with this thing. And so that's, that may well change the climate. Uh, I mean, it's going to have, obviously, going to impact the climate. But it might, in particular, change the climate with the British Isles. And these folks might have a much colder regime that they, uh, in other words, more typical of the environment that we would guess they would have just based on their uh, latitude alone. OK? There's other things, complicating stuff, things like Ek Ekman spirals and all these more complicated stuff. We don't have time to talk to you. You can take Dr. Patch's oceanography class. But the point is, all of this heterogeneity is really important, has impacts for, or implications for all kinds of life, where critters are distributed across the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's other structuring factors we, we're, we're not talking about, things like daily variation, all that spatial variation we talked about, year-to-year -year variation. There's other time scales. The most important time scales I'll just mention, and then we're going to end here, is uh, things like El Nino or El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO. It's also which typically varies in the Pacific every seven to eleven years. It's a different. We, we get one of these phenomenon presented. This, we get a so-called El Nino year, which is essentially all you need to know at this point is changed change condition from our normal condition. We all, there also is something called the um, uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO. There's the North Atlantic Oscillation. There's all these patterns that are overlaying these existing things, and they get comp more complex and more complex and more complex. For management, all we need to know is that there are these patterns here. And so if we develop a management regime or a proposal to deal with rainfall or to deal with pollution or invasive species or something, that's all good. Sometimes people fall into the trap of thinking, hey, what's been going last couple years? Check, okay, or maybe last decade or so. Let's create a solution to deal with that situation. And of course, that makes sense. And you should do that, but you should always have in the back of your head, hey, what if stuff changes, right? What if, what if, what if we get into a different regime? A di and this is, this, is not, this is nothing to do with climate change. This is just stuff that goes on regardless of climate change, right? Climate change is yet another crazier overlay on top of this. So, so we should have a, in the back of our mind at least, even though we're not oceanographers or climatologists, we should have in the back of our mind that there's this huge amount of complexity in these oceanic systems. 
And even though it looks like the ocean never changes, even though it looks the same to us when we stand at the beach and look out, um, it really is incredibly heter heterogeneous. And we want to make sure that our policies acknowledge that. Cool?